So, how's everybody doing today? Uh, this is Professor Ellis again for our English 2575 technical writing class. I appreciate you guys tuning in to watch another lecture video as we get a little bit further into the semester. Now we're beginning week six, if you believe it or not. Um, it seems like not so long ago that we just started the semester. So you guys are all been doing really good work uh, to get to this point. Um, and I know that some folks have reached out to me because of other things that may be um, causing some challenges uh, to getting the work accomplished in our class. Um, and, you know, these are the kinds of things that we can work around together. And I appreciate those students reaching out to me so that we can figure out, like, how to get them back on track. And I just want to offer that to everybody in the class, that if anything is going on, uh, that impacts your ability to do well in our class, uh, then let's talk it over. Because I think in almost every case, we can uh, devise a plan uh, that will get you back on track and doing the work and you're feeling confident in the work that you're doing uh, so that you can get the grade that you want. Uh, this is not a sink or swim class. I'm not throwing you in the deep end without a life preserver. I'm very much... Uh, the kind of professor that wants to make sure that each and every one of you uh, are able to learn and also demonstrate like what you're capable of doing um, without things that are you know beyond the bounds of our class uh, throwing a monkey wrench into things right because um, I think that this is a space where you know, you should be able to develop your communication skills develop some of the things that you can add to your resumes. Uh, so that you're a stronger candidate uh, for when you leave City Tech and while you're still at City Tech are able to continue doing really good work and show off some of these communication chops that you're picking up. So week six, uh, what we want to do during today's class is I just want to briefly go over some housekeeping stuff just to remind you about some things on our Open Lab site. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about the expanded definition project. Uh, maybe try to fill in some blanks in your thinking about what all is exactly involved in that. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about this week's uh, weekly writing assignment, uh, which is going to involve peer review on the rough drafts that you're working on for the 750 to 1,000 word uh, expanded definition project. So it'll be very much like the peer review that you did on the 500 word summary project. Um, and just to give you a heads up, the way it'll work is on Wednesday during my office hours, I will be sending out emails to each of the teams. I'm going to keep the teams the same as they were during our first round since you guys have had a chance uh, to meet one another virtually and interact. I'll send those emails out and then I'll want you to reply all with the same kind of polite professionalism, asking uh, for feedback on your work, and then offering you know, your feedback on the work of your uh, peer review teammates. Um, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you do in the workplace, which is why I want to model this uh, in our peer review sessions, so that you're like improving your writing by getting feedback, and you're also learning more about the writing of others uh, by doing peer review on their work. Uh, so this is something that you know, is advantageous for everyone. And in each stage of it, you're going to be uh, building your own communication acumen, your abilities, your skills, um, both through working on your own writing as well as being uh, engaged with the writing of others. So the housekeeping stuff. Uh, so first off, I just want to remind everybody that when you go to our Open Lab site, which I have open right now, uh, that if you don't see right away what you're looking for, like, for example, a lecture, remember to scroll down a little bit on the page. The way I've set it up right now is I'm keeping our most recent things uh, posted as what are called sticky posts. These are posts that are going to remain at the top of our reverse chron chronological list of posts on the Open Lab site so that they're always going to be at the top. And so you can see here uh, the featured, that means it's a sticky post, uh, is the weekly writing assignment week five. That's for last week, what you're working on right now. I'm going to scroll past it and the example of what your expanded definition project ought to look like. 
Then you can see it, the second featured post or sticky post is the lecture from last week, week five. Now, what you're listening to right now, assuming you are listening to it, uh, is going to be above these things because they're going to be newer once I get them posted. But you can keep scrolling down. And for the time being, because there's still like a couple of folks that need to get this turned in, I'm going to leave this post up for turning in the 500 word summary project. Um, but once these kind of recede in our attention and our focus in the class, I'll unsticky them so they'll go back in just reverse chronological order of all the posts, which are including mine as well as yours. So at that point, if you ever need to go back and find something like, say, weeks in the past, like you're like, oh, you know, I forgot to do a weekly writing assignment. I need to get caught up on it. Uh, but by God, I can't find it in the list of all these posts because there's so many posts from the professor as well as other students. Fear not. It's very easy to find things the way that I set up our Open Lab site. If you scroll back to the top of our Open Lab course site and then go below the avatar, you have the menu over here on the left. And you can see that home, that's where we're at right now. But you got a link to the syllabus, which you should always refer to to find out what we're doing and what's coming up. You can click on announcements to find out things that I announced to the class that I think are important. Sometimes they might be related to um, a project. Sometimes they might be related to like extra credit. Any of those kinds of things are going to show up under announcements. You can click on lectures and only the posts of my lectures will appear over here on the right hand side. So like if, for example, I'm just going to click lectures. You can see lecture week five, four, three, two. And this will be like uh, week two doo, 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 and week one. So everything's there. All the lectures are there, right? If I go back over to the menu, I can click on weekly writing assignments, which is going to be more important to you if you need to go back and make something up. And only those posts that relate to the weekly writing assignments, there's week five, week four, three, two, and then one. So everything's going to be listed there. And remember, with our class, not everything is always going to be turned in through OpenLab. You know, sometimes I'll give you specific instructions only to use email, for example, like with your peer review work. The reason for that is I want you to become more comfortable using these different tools to get the work done in our class. Because once you're in the workplace, you're going to find that you're going to be called on to use a lot of different tools and you're going to have to juggle all these different tools and technology, both for your work as well as just to communicate about your work. Um, and this is just a fact of life. You're not going to be able to necessarily change these systems. And I think it's very important for you all to keep in mind a really great piece of advice that I can give you is that whenever you start a new job, one of the first things that you ought to do is use like those that first day or two to try to familiarize yourself as much as possible with the systems and the methods that the team or the workplace already uses for communication that you'll want to mirror the way that they do things. Because one thing you don't want to do is to step into a new role and assume that maybe you know the best way to do it. An established team or an established workplace has already got a system in place more than likely that they're reliant on because it's a system that they've been using for some time. You as a new hire it, it are meant to step to be able to acclimate yourself to that system as quickly as possible so that you fit into that machinery, that you're able to keep things moving along efficiently. For you, it's something that you have to learn, but for all of those around you, they've already learned it, they've already used it, and they've internalized it. So I, it, the bottom line is that when you're first starting out, don't rock the boat. Learn the systems uh, and, and you know, kind of go into those things joyfully, despite whatever they might be like, in order to be a part of that team. Uh, because, you know, uh, there may be a time and place later that you can give constructive 
uh, criticism, constructive ideas about improving efficiencies by using a different tool. But the first day on the job is probably not the time to do that. All right, so the menu on the left-hand side, again, is a really great way to find the important stuff going on in the class. The same is true for opportunities, things that I think that you might benefit from, I'll post there. And you can click that link and you'll just see those things come up. So I'm going to go back to the home page. Uh, okay. And, you know, another thing to keep in mind, as I mentioned at the beginning of the semester, uh, each week I'll be posting a new lecture uh, and there'll be a new weekly writing assignment. And I'll schedule them to appear on our site on Wednesdays, usually Wednesday morning, unless something were to delay that, uh, in which case I'd probably put a post up on OpenLab uh, here at the very top of our homepage, letting you know uh, if something were to delay my being able to post those lectures and your assignments in a timely manner. Uh, but typically, I get these things scheduled so that they're going to be ready for you on Wednesday uh, at, the, at the earliest possible so that you can begin listening to the lecture and then begin doing the work. And always make sure that you do listen to my lecture before just jumping into some of the assignments. Um, I, it, it does, I appreciate the initiative that some students have shown by just jumping into the assignments. Unfortunately, there's a lot of context and a lot of background that I usually fit into the lectures that you need to know before going into the written assignments that I've placed on our Open Lab site. Uh, because obviously, uh, maybe it's not as obvious, but may, I should you know, spell this out, is you can imagine with different uh, media for communication that there are different bandwidths available for the conveyance of information from one person to another. And with speaking, Typically, you know, speaking and also listening on your part, uh, the bandwidth is quite high, especially if your um, reading speed is not as fast as your ability to hear, which typically it, it isn't. So I can fit in a lot more information through these spoken lectures than I can in actually just writing down everything verbatim that goes into the assignment. Secondarily, I also want you to be an active listener. And I'm going to talk more about active and passive engagement in just a minute. But just to prime you and prime your thinking about this, whenever you're listening to these lectures, and this is something I talked about from day one, I'm going to remind you about right now, make sure that you have something out to write with. To be an active listener means that you're using what you're hearing, what you're seeing in an active way in some other manner. So it's one thing just paying attention to what I'm saying and watching the video. It's another thing to be listening and having your notebook out and making notes as you listen to me. That is active engagement, whereas simply listening is passive engagement. So th this actually kind of leads us back into where I wanted to begin talking about um, the 750 to 1000 word expanded definition project that you're working on right now. And it has to do with this idea of active learning versus passive learning. That active learning is whenever you're doing something to learn something. Now you may say, well, if I'm reading a book, I'm doing something. But that kind of doing is a passive engagement. You, you can read the words on the page, but you know, probably from your own experience, I know I can say from mine, is that if you're reading something that you might find boring or that you're not interested in or that you're thinking in the back of your mind you would much rather be doing something else rather than reading something for class, is that that passive engagement allows your attention to wander. It saps your ability to engage the ideas that you're encountering through the words that you're reading, say in a book or on a page or listening to in a lecture. Active learning is when you're intentionally, meaning that you're making yourself do this, you're intentionally doing some work with or on 
the ideas that you're encountering through reading something on the page, listening to a lecture, or watching something on a video. So, for example, note-taking is much more active engagement and active learning exercise than simply just sitting there and listening to me talk. You can imagine from maybe your labs, whenever you're building, say, a circuit, or you're uh, building an apparatus, or you're putting something together, or you're fixing something, that hands-on activity is much more active than if someone were to simply explain to you how to fix something, how to put something together, how to build the circuit. Active engagement is, is causing you to do work with the ideas of what it is you're trying uh, to, to learn more about. Also, another part of this active learning is that you're able to demonstrate what you've learned and what you know how to do through that active engagement. So, for example, whenever we're uh, talking about making notes and you say maybe using some of those notes to assist you with a writing assignment or assist you with doing better research, you're actually able to show how you're doing something more with all this extra work that you're accomplishing as a part of the, the learning enterprise. So how does this fit into the 750 to 1,000 word uh, expanded definition project that you're working on right now? Well, as I've mentioned uh, in the previous lectures, all the assignments that you do in the class, I want the subject matter of those assignments to be something beneficial to you and your learning and what it is you want to do uh, with your degree as you move into a career after leaving City Tech. So with that in mind, I want you to use these assignments as an active learning exercise so that you're engaging these ideas, engaging the things that you want to learn more about in a very active way. That it should be something that obviously you're interested in, and it should also be something that you want to learn more about. You're wanting to fuel your curiosity through. And so with something like the uh, summary project that you just completed, most of you have done, really great work, what I've seen so far. With those 500-word uh, summaries of a technical article related to something that you have an interest in, that you're studying for, the way that you're reading that and then writing about that work through summarize, summarization should be much more actively engaging to you than if you were to just simply uh, have to summarize an article that I gave everybody in the class that had nothing to do with what any of you were interested in. At that point, it wouldn't be the active engagement, or at least not the same active engagement, that I think that you're going to experience with something that you have a vested interest in. Additionally, this kind of work that you're doing is something that you're going to be able to demonstrate um, your learning and your knowledge on a resume, on an e-portfolio, as a writing sample, as a way of being able to show that you're capable of doing more and knowing more than other applicants for the jobs that you're trying to get. Um, if you've had a chance to take a look at the job um, advice website and lecture, lecture that I posted last week, uh, and again, that wasn't anything that's required for our class. It's simply just something I made for your benefit. But if you had a chance to take a look at it, a big part of that has to do with trying to distinguish yourself from all the other qualified candidates for a job. And with these types of assignments in our class, not only are they preparing you for some of the writing that you're going to have to do in the workplace, but you can incorporate them as a part of the different materials that you submit for consideration for a job to show that you can do more and know more than the other people that are applying for that same job. Also, think about these different assignments in a modular fashion. Okay, Modular, as, as I'm sure you immediately are thinking about, has to do with like you know, Lego bricks, how things can fit together in order to make something larger out of smaller constituent parts. They're modular. Pull one out, put something else in. Well, if you think about um, appendices and reports. These are the additions that may sit at the back of a report that if someone needs to learn more about, say, a term or a piece of jargon or some data that's contained in the body of the report, 
they know that they can turn to the back to the appendices and find out some more information about X, Y, or Z contained in the report. Now, the reason why we don't want to put all the stuff into the body of the report is that we know that someone may already know those things. And so we don't want to bog down their ability to very quickly and efficiently you know, be able to read, understand, and then ultimately act on whatever information we're providing them through, say, a report. So this kind of work, like you know, with a article summary uh, or even with the 750 to 1,000 word expanded definition, these kinds of you know, documents you can think of in a modular fashion and be able to fit them in different ways into different types of documents or what in technical communication we call deliverables you may be called on to make. The same is true for instructions, which are going to be the thing that we work on in the next big project, you know, the, the last uh, individual project that you will do in the class. Uh, and also in, involves uh, proposals, whether it be grant proposals, project rep proposals, etc. Um, all of these things might need some additional explanation, some additional context for the terms and jargon that you may be needing to use in a report, in a proposal, that for all intents and purposes, some of your audience may already understand and know, but some of your audience might not. And so by including this extra information, like in an appendix, you're able to f um, give your readers the information they need when they need it in order to better understand what it is you're writing about and saying, what is the main argument in the document that you've produced. So what we can do next is turn our attention more specifically to the expanded definition project and in particular uh, about you know, what exactly we mean with definitions and about some of the examples that you may come across in your research, uh, both in terms of definitions as well as um, the context quotations and citations that you're going to be including in your uh, final document. So let's take a look at, at what the uh, expanded definition deliverable in general ought to look like. And again, this is just a guideline. Um, you, there's a lot of different ways that you could create this document, uh, but these are like, this is a overall good approach that I found students use in the past. So this is included on the weekly writing assignment week five as a, as a quote inside that post, but I'm also going to include it on the weekly writing assignment post for week six. So it'll be in both places. So you'll be able to find it very easily. And so it's at the bottom here and you can see it begins your name's expanded definition of your term. That's gonna be ultimately what you use for the title of the post that you create on OpenLab to turn this in in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we're not at that point yet, okay? Just whenever you're typing it all up in whatever word processor you're using for drafting, you can type at the very top that title. So you'll have it there and you'll be able to copy and paste it whenever you're ready to use it later on. Now, the main part of your deliverable is going to be in a memo format. And so it's going to begin with the to, from, date, subject lines at the very top. And then a new thing we're going to be adding to this document are headings. And I'll explain how to format those headings on OpenLab whenever we get to turning these in in a couple of weeks. So there'll be what I post on, uh, not this week, uh, but next week. So I'll explain it all next week for you. Uh, but as far as your drafting is concerned, just add on a line the word introduction. And then in that first paragraph, this is where you say what the purpose of the document is. You want to include what is the term that you're going to be providing an expanded definition for. And then ultimately, at the end of that paragraph, you should provide a roadmap for your reader. This roadmap explains what's going to be following next. And you could say something as simply, uh, in this document, I will first dis discuss several definitions for this term followed by several contextual discussions. And finally, I will provide a working definition of the term. So in your roadmap, you're laying out uh, what are the main 
um, milestones that we're going to reach in each section of the document. And that corresponds with these other headings. Definitions, context, working definition, and then finally the references, but you don't need to include references in your roadmap. That'll be something that people will understand should come at the conclusion of your document. Now, after that very short introduction, you'll have a section titled Definitions. And then in the Definitions section, this is where you want to go out and find several places where definitions, where a definition is a statement that says, this term means this. This term is this. Where you have a term and then you have an explanation for what it is. A definition is something that we can immediately you know, get a sense of what that word or that piece of jargon means. Now, I, I really want to drive home this point because I saw in some of the uh, weekly writing assignments, uh, there might have been some misunderstanding on the part of some students about exactly what we mean by definition. A definition is always going to give us uh, the essence of what a term is. Not in something, and I don't want you to think of it in terms of like the sentence needs to provide us a meaning that is implied. A true definition is going to give us point blank what that term means, okay? And we're going to take a look at, at some examples in a minute. Now, the next section for context, these will be places where you can find the term you're researching, where it appears in a rando sentence that you find, like say in a journal article, a magazine article, a newspaper article, or a website. And from that sentence, we might not know what the definition is. It might be something that we can imply, but it's not a point blank statement about what the word means. The context quotations that you'll discuss in this section of the 750 to 1000 word expanded definition document are intended to help us better understand how the term gets used in sentences relating to that word or that piece of jargon. So again, those context quotes that you find, simply your jargon appears in a sentence. We might get an idea about what it means, but we might also not. And in most cases, we probably won't. And that's fine because what your job is, after you quote a sentence that gives us the, the piece of jargon in context within that larger sentence, you get to explain to us what that sentence means and how that piece of jargon relates to what that sentence means. That's the discussion that needs to take place when we're talking about these contextual uses of the term of the piece of jargon that you're writing your 750 to 1000 word expanded definition project about. So definitions are going to be point blank. This is what it means. You provide a little bit of explanation and then move on to the next definition. And then finally, in that definition section, you can maybe explain if there's any discrepancies. You might compare and contrast the two definitions because they might be a little bit different. That would be good. That would be beneficial. That would help us understand what that word means better. But then in the context section, you find the piece of, you find that jargon uh, that word in a sentence somewhere, you quote it, give us a parenthetical citation for it, and then you explain what that sentence means in relation to the word that you're writing your expanded definition on. And then finally, the very last section is the working definition. And that's where you, using your mind and what you've learned about the term from the definitions you've quoted and from those quotations where the term gets used in sentences, you provide us your own working definition for the term in your own words, in your own language. 
So in a sense, you need to put away all of your research and rely on what you've learned from the research to write your working definition. Your working definition will be how you would define the term in your own words. All right, so why don't we take a look again about where to find some of those definitions at? Because uh, I want to make sure everybody has a really good selection of definitions uh, for the terms that you all are researching. And I'm also going to give you some tips on Jeopardy. So I want you all to do well on Jeopardy one day so that, uh, you know, you're winning a bunch of money, you're going to come back to City Tech, and you're going to treat me to a, a steak dinner over at Henry's End. Okay? Deal? Deal. All right, so here we go. Let's go open a new tab and go over to where are we going to go? What's my favorite website I tell you guys about all the time? library.citytech.cuny.edu. So remember, the library's website is where you primarily want to turn to do your, uh, your research on these assignments. Um, for your definitions, they need to come from library sources. For your contextual quotations, you can use some of the resources through the library. I would certainly recommend it. But you can also turn to other places like the New York Times, which I told you last week how to sign up for a free account. If maybe you skipped over that part of the lecture, all you got to do is go to nytimes.com slash passes. That's going to bring you to this page so you can create an account, put in your City Tech email address, make up a password. You're going to get a free year of the New York Times online. I mean, you're tr it's a tremendous savings to you that you get as a benefit of being a City Tech student. Use this invaluable resource to help you with your research. Um, and so, like, just for example, why don't we start with that? All right, so I made a list of three terms that I saw some folks were using uh, for their expanded definition projects. Okay? And... In a minute, we'll go back to the library and we're going to look up definitions. But let's let's put our caps on and we're going to skip over definitions and we're going to think about the context quotations for the context section of our expanded definition project. And what I would suggest, once you got your New York Times uh, subscription, click over on the search icon in the upper left. See this over here, this little spyglass? Not a spyglass, a magnifying glass. It's going to bring up a search box when you click on it. And one of the terms that uh, a, a student's researching our class is biotechnology. Pretty broad, uh, but not impossible uh, for uh, the project. And so with this, after I've typed that in, I'm showing 9,758 results. I could, I could just scroll through a couple of these and probably find where biotechnology appears in a sentence. Um, you know, why don't we go to horseshoe crabs? I've seen a lot of horseshoe crabs. You know, uh, my hometown, Brunswick, Georgia. When I go to the beach on St. Simon's Island or on Jekyll, and you know, I got this article here. I know that biotechnology should appear somewhere in it, uh, but I, maybe I don't have time to read the whole thing, right? And I'm not expecting you to. I can just press Control F, or if you're on a Mac, you can press Command F, and search on the page for biotechnology. Now, Firefox here is telling me that there's only one match, and it's right here, where they're listing it as a description for this company, Lonza AG. So I could use this sentence, uh, actually, I highlighted two sentences. I only need this. Longa AD, comma, a multinational biotechnology company sells both tests. So I could use that quote, make a parenthetical citation for it, create a reference at the bottom of my document for this page on the New York Times website. And then after I've quoted this in the context section of my expanded definition document, I would then want to explain in my own words what the hell is going on in this sentence? I would want to explain maybe to say something that in this sentence, we can see that the word 
biotechnology is being used to describe the multinational company Longza AG, which, in, as the article describes, sells a particular type of test. And in that case, you probably would want to find out by skimming the article what kind of tests they're talking about, and you could, you could refer to that. But that explanation tells us that it's a type of company that works in biotechnology. That's what you would want to say. I know it may seem very uh, obvious, but in this kind of document, you want to take the reader by the hand. You want to guide us and break it down for us, whoever your reader is. And in this case, you are imagining someone who, who likely knows the same amount as you know, someone else that is learning in your profession about these things. And so you want to help them understand what you're learning through this project, through this reading that you're doing. So break things down. You, there's no way, I think, that you could, in a sense, make this oversimplified. It's okay to really break it down to explain you know, how biotechnology uh, relates to this company that is a company based in different nations that makes a certain kind of test that you'll want to find out what it is and to explain maybe in reference to the definitions you quoted what it relates to the kind of work a company like this might do. You explain that to us in your own words. And the more that you read, the more that you do this research and you spend time with it, the easier that'll be because you will have learned this work, learned these ideas through the work that you do by the research, the reading, the making notes that all lead up to the, the final deliverable that you're producing. So let's go back to the search page. Um, I also want to show you over here on the right, you can change the way that the results are sorted. So like if I wanted to find like the oldest place that biotechnology might appear, then I'm able to go through and like you can see here, 1937, um, Tomorrow's Inventions. All right, so let's see if we can find, is it going to, unfortunately, this page doesn't actually show me, this PDF doesn't have the text searchable. So what I would have to do is scan through this with my eyes to try to find where the term biotechnology appears. So I can see they're talking about Eli Whitney and you know, the cotton gin. Talking about creating a national policy of technology. They're mentioning H.G. Wells. So a lot of stuff is packed into this article from 1937. Uh, and then here finally, though we stand on the threshold of a new era in biotechnology, comma, only the immediate prospects of plant and animal breeding, comma, soil bacteriology, and the like are envisioned. Stop. And so I could pull that sentence out, create a citation based on the information that they give me here on this page, I can see New York Times. It appeared in Sunday, July 18, 1937. It gives me the page number. So I got the main information that I'm going to need for my uh, APA uh, formatted reference, right? Uh, so I got that information. I got the quote. I can plug that quote into my contact section and then explain a little bit about what that sentence means in relation to the term biotechnology. And so I could use maybe a range of, of dates, maybe this example from 1937, maybe try to find one from like, say, 
mid-century, and then maybe one from more recently, like the horseshoe crab article we just looked at. And by looking at how the term gets used in these different contexts, you might be able to draw a conclusion about you know, what, how the term might have changed a little bit over time or how the terms remain the same. You get to say that because you will have learned about the relationship between these different quotations you use and how that quote gets used over time. I'm not saying that you have to use this chronological method, but it is, you know, I think, one good way to try to get at the heart of how the terms get used in context and how those terms might change or might remain the same over time in different ways. So all this you could do through the New York Times. I mean, a phenomenal resource that you can have access to for free. So keep that in mind as being something that can help you with the context quotations. So I've gone back to the library's website because I want to actually look at the definition part. You're the, the, the heart, really, of this document because you've got to have some good definitions uh, to work with. And I'm going to show you the same stuff I showed you the other day, but we're going to go through some more examples. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to go to the research guides over here on the left. Okay. And then under research guides, I'm going to go to computer engineering technology. And then on the computer engineering technology page, I'm going to go and click on encyclopedias over on the left. Now, in the previous lecture, I also showed you how to uh, look for ebooks. Uh, those are also fair game for you to use, uh, but I'm going to show you maybe uh, a good shortcut that's going to pull up potentially some good definitions for you to quote in the definition section of your expanded definition project. So the three main ones I want to focus on are here at the bottom. The Gale Virtual Reference Library, the Oxford English Dictionary, and Oxford Reference. So I'm going to start off with the Gale Virtual Reference Library. It's going to redirect me. If you haven't logged in yet, you're going to have to log in using your CUNY first. ID. Now it's asking me to log in, so I'm going to log in. All right, and from this search page, I'm just going to type in, let's start again with biotechnology. And from this search, these very first ones, because it's sorted by relevance, it's going to be showing me things that are more than likely encyclopedic or dictionary entries for biotechnology. And so for this Encyclopedia of Global Industries, that sounds like maybe a, a useful source. Encyclopedia of Science and Religion uh, may have the, uh, a useful uh, definition, but pay attention, though, to which sources you are looking at so that you are choosing ones that are going to give you uh, the most bang for your buck and also have the best appearance as a source useful for your domain, for your field of study, for your uh, field that you're going to be working in. Uh, Berkshire Encyclopedia of World Sport, that one you might not want to rely on if sports isn't something related to the workplace stuff that you're going to be doing. Uh, biotechnology and Environmental Encyclopedia. In many cases, uh, environmental you know, uh, aspects of biotechnology might be relevant to many of you in the class. This might be one that we want to take a look at. So all I do is click on the title for that entry. You see how there's a bar separating each entry. Click Biotechnology. And then it gives me the page number. At the top of the page, I got all the other information I need for citing it, the author, the date, the book, volume, edition, publisher. So I got all the information that I need, and then I can scroll through until I can find something that reads more like a definition. Because, I mean, this whole thing, in essence, is an expanded definition of biotechnology. They're giving us a lot of context and background. And what I really want to find is where they tell me in a very concise and straightforward way what biotechnology is. 
Now I can see here they are quoting a definition from the European Federation of Biotechnology. I, you, if you look over at the Purdue OWL website, you can see how you can cite something that someone has quoted from another source, meaning that it's you know, secondhand quotation. And I don't want to say those are you know, not fair game. They are. But I would recommend avoiding those unless you have time to track down where the original quote comes from. The reason why I say that is from my own experience, a lot of times where I've come across these types of quotes, sometimes they turn out to be inaccurate or maybe partially accurate. And that you know, creates a conundrum for me if I am going to use them. I'm obviously not going to quote from this source. I'm going to go back to the horse's mouth, so to speak, and quote from that primary source so that it's accurate and I'm able to point exactly to where it come from and that I can myself attest to its accuracy. But if I just quote from here and then say quoted in biotechnology by David Newton an environmental encyclopedia, I'm relying on him and he may be wrong. I want to like say that he is, but there's always that possibility. So try to track your, your quote, your, your secondary quotes back if you decide to use those. Let's see, though, if we delve a little bit deeper in this document, if we can find his own definition that we can quote. And what do you know? The next sentence is exactly what we need. And this is all the words from David Newton. This is from him. This is his primary. He is the primary source here. Biotechnology is that is that's right there. Think of it as an equal sign. Okay. Okay. It's biotechnology equals, and then we have a definition, an interdisciplinary field incorporating biochemistry, information technology, molecular biology, microbiology, pathology, embryology, and cell biology, with other fields being incorporated over time as technology advances. So that right there, if I'm writing my you know, essay, my expanded definition project on biotechnology, I would want to use that as one of my definitions. It sounds really good. It includes a lot of information that I could then discuss in my own words to explain how it's interdisciplinary um, and also how it involves technology. So, I mean, a lot of stuff is wrapped up into that that I could use. So, I'm going to go back to the results now. So, how about this? You know, this is biotechnology on the Gale... This is called the Gale Virtual Reference Library. Let me try some others that, that you guys are working on. Cybersecurity. All right, so looking through these, and, and each of these results shows me like a little snippet of where that term appears. Um, here in this Sage Encyclopedia of Educational Technology, it gives us a good definition, but I, I may want to think about, do I want to quote something from Encyclopedia of Educational Technology if my field of specialization in cybersecurity has nothing to do with education? Maybe you don't. I would probably want to find something more relevant, right? So even though this does look pretty good, cybersecurity, comma, or, that or in this case is the equal sign that you're looking for for a definition. They could just have easily said cybersecurity cyber is the discipline of protecting information environments, etc. But if I'm wanting to look for something that is maybe more focused on the work that I'm doing, uh, like let's say I'm all about you know, building technologies that, are, that protect people's privacy. This privacy rights in the digital age book might have a good definition. So I'm going to click on cybersecurity here. Again, at the very top, it gives me all the reference information I need, author, editor, date, book title, publisher, and then I got the page number it appears on, cybersecurity, a critical and necessary component of computer systems implemented to protect computer users and networks from threats from nefarious cyber actors to protect them from computer disruptions that are intended and unintended, as well as to prepare for unpreventable natural disasters. 
very first sentence is my definition. I could pull that out, quote it, give my parenthetical citation, create my reference at the bottom of my document, and then I explain a little bit about what's going on in that definition in my own words. Boom, another definition ready to use uh, in my article, in my expanded definition uh, paper. Just looking at some of these other um, books that have definitions. Uh, Ethics, Science, Technology, and Engineering. It's got a definition. Economics of Cybersecurity. Uh, the snippet doesn't look exactly like a definition, so it, this may have more to do with what it says here, the economics of cybersecurity, something more specialized. The role of government regulating the private sector. Presidential Policy Directive 20. So here I'm getting into more things like getting further afield than what might strictly be a definition. These will probably be places where I will find cybersecurity as a contextual use of the term. So it won't give me a definition, but it might give me a quote that I could use for the context section of my expanded definition document. So again, you, you need to look through these results to get a feel where at the beginning you got more that are like definitions. As you get further down, you get more to where you're going to be getting contextual uh, uses of the jargon of the technical term that you selected. How about another uh, term that I saw people looking up? Quantum computing. Hot topic right now. You probably heard about D-Wave's new offering today. I think D-Wave is actually, I mean, they're, obviously they're very smart people that, that uh, run that company. Uh, but you know, earlier on they were building quantum computing machines uh, and then sending them out. But now that they're deciding to make you know, much more scalable machines and providing them essentially uh, through the cloud so that people can take advantage of them uh, without actually needing to have a quantum computer on site, which requires upkeep and special work to make to make operational. Uh, but it's smart also on the part of the company because they essentially can charge rents uh, on the use of that service rather than uh, a physical piece of equipment. Uh, so in a sense, quantum computing is a service, I guess. Uh, but in any event, um, this is something I read in the news today. Uh, so quantum computing, I got right here. First one, this is going to be a definition. Uh, but this is more like an expanded definition in the Gale Encyclopedia of Science, where at the beginning, this part right here, if you read over it, is giving you some of that context information, background information about what about what computing is in general before, bam, right here, giving you a definition of what quantum computing is. And so with some of these definitions, think of them as expanded definitions themselves. And you can learn a little bit about how they are structured. They're not structured exactly the way that you're making yours, uh, because you're having to do a little bit more legwork uh, to learn more about these terms than necessarily what goes into these. Uh, but it's at the same time, that discussion that takes place around the term and some of the background that gets explained about the term might be beneficial for your thinking to think like, what do I need to let my reader know in order to understand the term that I'm discussing in my expanded definition project? All right, so that's the Gale Virtual Reference Library. So three terms, different terms, we're able to find stuff without any problem. Now let's take a look at the Oxford English Dictionary. Again, I mentioned it before, but let's go in a little more depth on this. So this time it didn't ask me to log in because I just logged in previously uh, for the Gale Virtual Reference Library. And let's start with the first term, biotechnology. And here, Biotechnology, comma, in, meaning noun, gives me some information on its origin. But here, next to the numeral one, is the actual definition that I would want to quote. The application of science and technology to the utilization and improvement of living organisms for industrial and agricultural production and in later use, other biomedical applications, semicolon, 
a technique or technology used in this way. And so with this right here, I got a really good definition that I can quote in my expanded definition document. One thing about Oxford English Dictionary is it does give you some very easy to use uh, a citation tool in the upper right hand corner right here. I can click on cite. The thing though, I may have mentioned this you know, two, two or three lectures ago when we first talked about OED, is that when you use the citation tool, it doesn't give you the option for APA format. It gives you MLA uh, version 7, version 8, and Chicago. And what you can do though, is you can copy this information into the reference section of your document and then go over to the Purdue OWL website, which I've talked about before, ad infinitum. That's Latin, means to infinity, ad infinitum. And let's see, where can we find other prince horses? <clears throat> Entry in a dictionary thesaurus or encyclopedia with a group author, with an individual author. And here what we find is that the AP manual does not provide specific guidance on how to cite physical reference works such as dictionaries, thesauruses, or encyclopedias. Therefore, this citation, as well as the one for an individual author, an entry, and a reference work, reference work would be those books that we were just looking at um, on the Gale Virtual Reference Library, is modeled on that of a chapter in an edited book or anthology, both which are similar in format to reference works. So you see here they give you a model, institution or organization name, year, title of entry, in, you give the title of the reference work, in this case the Oxford English Dictionary, the edition, what page number it appears on, and publisher name. So if we go back over to the OED, a lot of that information is already included on here. The company's name is Oxford University Press. The title of the work is OED Online. The entry is Biotechnology in for noun. Um, we got the date, September 2020. What else do we need? And do we need page number? So here they don't actually give us that. And I'm scanning. And in the OED online, we don't have access to a page number. And so what we would use in place of these page numbers here is NP, N period, P period, no pages, meaning that is there's no page numbers that are given. Now, another thing that I want to point out to you on the OED is that in addition to giving you a definition, it does give you, for many of these terms, multiple definitions. And so you may look at these other definitions. So the second definition for biotechnology the application of science and technology to practical problems of living, the study of the interaction of human beings and technology. CF period. All right, so this is where we're starting to get into Jeopardy territory, but these are things that you need to know if you don't already know them. So CF period is an abbreviation. This is a Latin term called confer, C-O-N-F-E-R. And what confer means in English is to compare. So CF period in this context is compare in, in Latin, which means to compare. So when you write CF period space and then another word, it means compare what gets written here, this part right here, compare that with bioengineering. And if you just mouse over the term, it actually gives you a little pop-up and gives you what that term means. Now, a couple of other uh, abbreviations I, I want you guys to know about. Pardon me. 
include I period, E period, okay, I period, E period, all together, I, E is the way you usually say it. In Latin, I period, E period is an abbreviation for id est, I-D space E-S-T, id est. Id est means that is. And we often use I period, E period, comma, and then some, uh, maybe another term or an explanation, meaning further explanation about this thing you just mentioned. So, for example, I could say, um, Hello Kitty is a cute cat, comma, uh, I.E., that is a kawaii uh, Japanese anime character. So it's I.E. means that is. It means further explanation or maybe um, providing a little bit more context for what it is you just talked about. I also want you guys to know the uh, abbreviation EG. E period, G period. All together, no spaces. E.G. is Latin for exempli gratia, exempli gratia. And what that means is for example. And so if I were to give um, another sentence, in Japanese culture, uh, kawaii or cute characters are widely known E.G., for example, Hello Kitty, comma, uh, Rilakkuma, comma, etc. So the E.G. is a way of very briefly saying, for example. And you're probably going to see me write, like if I send you an email response or feedback on a paper, I'll use some of these abbreviations. So if you happen to forget what they mean, you can look them up. Even like in the Oxford English Dictionary, you can type in, like, I period, E period, right? I period, E period, it is Latin, that is to say, I can click view full entry, e.g. brings up uh, the full definition, for example, or for instance, and then here it tells me that it's an initialism, exempli gratia. So the idea is like use these tools, like if you need to find out something, don't hesitate to use a dictionary because the quality of the information, if it contains information on what you're looking for, will be of a much higher class, I think, in most cases, than if you just do a rando search through Google, DuckDuckGo, or Bing, or any of the other search engines. Uh, because you don't quite know what your page might get served up. Uh, all right, so that's the OED. Uh, and I'll just, for the last one, so we did... Uh, I'm at the very bottom, so let's go back up. So that was uh, biotechnology, cybersecurity. That's come up, security relating to computer systems or the internet, especially that intended to protect against viruses or fraud. And I can also look up quantum computing. Now, this is a special case because quantum computing here does say that it's a noun, but they don't actually give us a definition for it. All they're giving us are contextual uses of the term historically. So it appears in 1985 in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, 1988 in the magazine Computer World, and then 1997 in the Baltimore Sun newspaper. We can get a sense probably for what you know, this this term means, but here they're not actually giving us a definition. But now if we scroll up, and this is just by chance in this, this case, that we see something very similar, quantum computation, which is you know, obviously closely related to quantum computing. Here it gives us examples of where it appears, but then you can see here for these compounds, I mean it's a compound word, two words put together, right, that it gives us what this is in reference to of the main definition of quantum. 
near the first word in the compound. And so it's, in a sense, A period, 5 period. So if I click that, here it brings up that definition. Physics, a minimum amount of physical quantity which can exist and in multiples of which it can vary. CF, you guys know what that means, right? Compare. So it means you in reference to or refer to or compare with quantum theory. Uh, 5A, a discrete quantity of electromagnetic energy proportional in magnitude to the frequency of the radiation it represents, such that energy of the frequency may only be transmitted in multiples of the quantity. So they're talking about quantum computation is in re relationship to this particular use of the word quantum. Now, for you looking for definitions, what does that tell you about quantum computing? Probably don't want to use the Oxford, Diction Oxford English Dictionary as one of your sources because it doesn't give you that straightforward um, definition. Find it through one of the other sources. That's totally fine. You're not going to be able to find everything in every one of these sources. Part of the work that you're encountering right now is learning through practice how to use these different types of research tools uh, to, to the best part of your ability. The, the key thing about using these as research tools is the more you use them, like if you actually will sit down and spend time with them, you will gain a lot of knowledge simply by experimentation. I could walk you through and tell you, do this, do that, do this other, but that kind of passive engagement with these tools will not help you nearly as much as if you spend some time experimenting on your own in active engagement. You see how everything is coming full circle in this lesson, right? Through that active engagement of experimentation, of satisfying your curiosity, you will learn much more about how to use and which of these different resources have information relevant to the research that you're doing. All right, so we got one last resource I want to go over, and that's the Oxford Reference here at the bottom. So the Oxford Reference Database uh, is providing a, access to a, a variety of different sources, not just the, it's not the Oxford English Dictionary, which is only a dictionary. So on this page, I can click in this search box in the upper right-hand corner and start plugging in the terms I've been looking for, biotechnology. Let's start with that one. All right, so it gives me this overview, but now this overview, um, if I click on it, and I did find that of the different sources, this is one of the slower ones to use. So this quick reference is something that you can read, but this isn't the kind of thing that you want to cite because you can see that it's from biotechnology and a dictionary of public health. You can read this. It may help your understanding, but this is coming from somewhere else. And this is not where we want to be quoting things from secondhand, if at all possible. So let's go back to the list of sources because here we got actual um References from a Dictionary of Construction, a Dictionary of Mechanical Engineering, a Dictionary of Genetics. That one might be a good source for finding a definition of biotechnology, wouldn't you think? Genetics, biotechnology, manipulation of uh, genes using different types of technology. Uh, so let's click on that. So I'm going to click on Biotechnology here. At the very top, I got all of my reference information that I need, the title, authors, publisher, date, and then biotechnology. Then it gives me a definition. The collection of industrial processes that involve the use of biological systems. For, for some industries, these processes involve the use of genetically engineered microorganisms. Very short, very concise, but it's a definition, straightforward. I can scroll down some more. P a dictionary of plant sciences sounds pretty good. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. That one's probably pretty good. Uh, so let's see what it's got. So 
So here at the very beginning is giving us just like that uh, previous source that we looked at a minute ago, I think in the, was it the Gale virtual reference library? It gives us that European Federation of Biotechnology General Assembly kind of definition. But here after that semicolon, we get a field of technological activity in which biochemical, genetic, microbiological, engineering techniques are combined for the pursuit of technical and applied aspects of research into biological materials and in particular into biological processing. It includes traditional technologies, et cetera, et cetera. This right here, I would just quote that part right there because that's firsthand from this source where I got all the author and editor information up here at the top that I could cite as a definition in my research um, project, my expanded definition. So again, you have to delve into each of these definitions and then make a value judgment. You know, Do I need the whole thing? Is there a part of this that I can take out that serves as my definition? And in this case, I think definitely you can. You don't need to quote the secondhand definition parts. Go directly for what they are providing you with. Firsthand, primary source. Now let's try some of these other terms. Cybersecurity. Again, this is one of the slower databases for whatever reason right now. So here I get a definition from the a Dictionary of Politics and International Relations in China. Might not be the best source because even in their definition, they say cybersecurity in parentheses in relation to China. That's probably great for someone involved in like, you know, uh, political science stuff. But for most of us in here, that's probably not as relevant. Um, again, Dictionary of Politics and International Relations, probably not the best place. Oxford Rhyming Dictionary. If you're writing a rap song about, you know, cybersecurity, you want to look here. But for us, we're going to skip it. Uh, the New Oxford American Dictionary. Uh, that might be a place that you could use because I mean, it's a dictionary, uh, but it's just like a general dictionary. Oxford Dictionary of English, also an English dictionary. Uh, international Relations, International Relations, International Relations. And then we're starting to get into other terms and other places that might not have as much relevance. This entry on cyberspace um, does include the word cybersecurity, but it doesn't give you a definition. However, you could use this entry here to take this sentence, sculpting the architecture and aesthetics of cyberspace must now compete with concerns about cybersecurity and the threat of cyber warfare as one of your contextual sentences. So when you're going through these sources, you have to be able to uh, code switch very quickly between like, am I just looking for a definition or am I looking for a context quote? Because depending on what you find, one of these sources might be better for a definition while another source might be better for a contextual quote. And that's perfectly fine to be looking at those, looking for those simultaneously. All right. So again, just to wrap this up with the 750 to 1000 word expanded definition project, the idea is to gather some straightforward definitions that you discuss in your own words of the term that you're researching and find some uses of the, of the term in sentences that don't define it, but that you in your own words would then explain to the reader, like, what does this sentence mean and how does it relate to the term that you're researching in your expanded definition project? And then based on your discussion of the definitions in the first part, the discussion of the contextual quotations in the next section, you then conclude with your own working definition of the term. And that's really where you do work of synthesizing. Synthesizing is where you take in your know, different ideas, different perspectives, and put them together on your own using your mind to come up with a working definition, like a definition that you could then tell to someone who were to ask you, like maybe someone you, um, you wants to find out more about what you do, and they would say, well, what is cybersecurity? Well, your working definition could be the first thing that you tell them about. 
And then based on that, you could then expand on it and give them some more context. But that working definition is like your go-to explanation for what that term means. All right. So based on the, the writing, uh, weekly writing assignment from week five, to close things out, is you've been sharing some of the quotes you've been finding as a comment on this blog post, this weekly writing assignment week five blog post. You guys have been doing that right now. I see them coming in. That's great. Also, I asked you to begin working on your first draft of the expanded definition project. It's okay if today you don't have that completed, but you want to work at getting that done as quickly as possible because you need, as soon as you can, to click reply all to the email that I will be sending to you and your team to begin peer review of that draft of your um, 750 to 1000 word expanded definition project. Okay, so this week's writing assignment is you're going to be doing peer review of each other's 750 to 1000 word expanded definition first drafts. You're going to be asking for feedback and you're going to be offering your services as a uh, peer reviewer on your other teammates writing. This is going to help you get better at giving feedback, better at receiving feedback, and it's also going to improve your writing, not just through making your writing better based on the feedback that you receive, but by exposing yourself to more people's writing styles, you actually pick up tips. You're going to pick up ways of doing things. You're also going to recognize things that you would never want to do because you're going to say, well, that's just wrong. But by you recognizing it's wrong and then being able to explain to someone else like this is wrong because you, you're using the wrong verb tense or you're using plural rather than singular uh, number here. Those types of things help you better understand and utilize those different uh, aspects of writing uh, than if you were just you know, not be cognizant of that at all. So with this weekly writing assignment, I'll circulate emails to each team with basic instructions. Overall, click reply all to the email that I send you so that I get to see it and everybody in your team sees it. Make a polite and professional ask for feedback on your paper. And make an offer to help others by giving your feedback to them on your papers. This is an important thing to learn to do whenever you're talking about um, different types of transactions that we do professionally, personally. It's like if you're making an ask, I mean, certainly you could ask for a favor, but usually things work a lot better if when you're making an ask, you also make an offer of like what you'll give in return for this. So if you're asking for feedback, why not offer your feedback in return? It's a fair exchange. So ask and offer. Where I would like you to focus your feedback on the papers that you read from your teammates. And again, every time you give feedback, remember to click reply all. Because I need to see the work that's taking place so I can give everybody credit for doing that work as your weekly writing assignment. But it's also useful, I think, for everybody in your team to see examples of how everybody's giving peer review feedback. It may give them ideas about how to do it uh, because I know everybody's going to have different levels of experience with doing this kind of peer review feedback. So in a sense, you're helping one another by giving more examples than I could possibly give you in like you know, this short lecture that I give you every week. Now. What I would like you to focus on with the feedback that you give each other after you click reply all is address these four things. And I'll write these out and put them on our open lab site too, just so you have it as a reference. But listen to them now. One, are there the main sections present? These would be, if you think back to the very first lecture when I talked about you know, rhetoric and writing uh, strategies, that idea of strategic and tactical levels. 
So if we're asking, are there the main sections present? That would be introduction, uh, definitions, context, uh, working definition, and references. Those are the main sections. And of course, the memo uh, header at the top. Those are strategic concerns. Those are big picture concerns. So we need to make sure they're there before we really focus on anything else. So again, introduction, definitions, context, working definitions and references, and of course the memo header at the top. If something is missing or maybe needs more development, just point that out to the author. When I say the author, your teammate. Just say, hey, you're missing the introduction or missing references. Your, your, your expanded definition needs to have that. Two, in the definition section, are there at least two library source definitions and are they discussed in the author's own words? So just count how many you know, references there are there. Do they have the parenthetical citations? Do they have quotation marks? And does the person discuss them in some way? If not, point it out. Just say, hey, I see you got one definition there, but there's no discussion. There's no other quotation. You need to add one more quotation and you need to discuss them. That's it. You don't have to do it for them. Just point out what needs to get done. In a sense, think about when you're reading someone else's paper as your own. If you had to turn it in as your paper for a grade, what would you change to make it right? Just tell that person that's what you, you would do if it were your paper to make it uh, correct. Number three, in the context section, how many sentences are quoted from your different sources? Are they all cited? Meaning are there quotation marks and there's there a parathetical in-text citation after each? Is there a reference for them at the end of the paper? And are they discussed in the author's own words? So again, you got to give the quote and you got to give some discussion about what it means. Why is it you know, relevant? What does that term mean in the sentence? Help us understand what's going on in relation to the term you're researching and the sentence that you're quoting. If that's not taking place, let the person know they need to fix that. And then four, look over each in-text citation and reference at the end, make sure there's one for each at the end, and see if they follow APA format, roughly. You don't have to correct them, but if something seems off, you should recommend that the author double check either the parenthetical and text citations and or the references at the end before they turn in their paper to me. Uh, so again, it's like you're giving them another set of eyes because they may have overlooked something and you giving them this feedback will help them like make their paper better. And you're hoping that they're going to give you that same kind of feedback on, on your paper. All right, so uh, I'll get this uh, typed up into a uh, post for the week six weekly writing assignment. So look for two new blog posts on our open lab site. One's going to be the week six lecture. That would be the video that I'm recording right now. And then also look for the weekly writing assignment, which is going to talk about that peer review stuff. Oh, and I'll be sending out those peer review emails uh, during my office hours on Wednesday. Remember, my office hours Wednesdays 3 to 5 p.m. I'll post the link to the Google Hangout on our Open Lab site uh, just before uh, office hours begin. Just click the link and then click Join Hangout, and then you'll find me. I'll be there. Um, if you can't come to office hours and you need to talk to me about something in relation to the class, something you don't understand, just shoot me an email. Let me know what your availability is for the next week or so, like what times you're available to talk. And then I'll look at my schedule and we'll coordinate a time and day that works for both of us. I don't mind doing that. Uh, but it's important that you reach out to me because I don't know if you might need that extra support. So just let me know your availability and then I'll get back to you with a time that may work for both of us. Uh, and then I'll do this. I will be meeting with a student on Thursday uh, to answer some questions. So this is something that I do, um, but it's something that we have to work out together. Um, and so you come to my office hours, email me if you have questions. Uh, make an appointment for an office hour outside of my normal office hours if necessary. 
and most importantly right now, above everything else going on with our class, okay? Make sure you guys are staying safe. You know, wear a face covering, whether it be a mask or one of the other kinds that have been de uh, described by health officials that you can make and use. Uh, social distance yourself. Be aware of like who you might be around and where they might have been because I don't want to see anybody getting sick and having this virus derail your success in the class. Also, right now is the time to be getting a flu shot. Get a flu shot to protect yourself from the flu so you don't also have to worry about catching that on top of or in addition to or in place of the coronavirus, okay? Um, so make sure you're looking into that as well. Um, and of course, after you can take care of yourself, take care of others. You know, proselytize this stuff to, to your family members. Because I don't, I mean, already too many people have died from this thing. Too many people have gotten sick. I personally know people that are long haulers, that after they got over the virus, after, you know, weeks of you know, fever and, and coughing and everything else, they have long-term health effects from this virus. I don't want that to happen to you guys, okay? So protect yourselves, protect your loved ones, okay? Um, also, uh, one last thing I'll mention is I got an email um, from uh, the interim provost, um, and she said that if anybody's in need of any extra technology, if like your laptop broke or if you need uh, internet or any of that kind of stuff, uh, reach out to me. And I will put you in touch. Um, I think I can uh, submit some information or have you submit information to the school so that you can um, check out some equipment that we have available at City Tech. Uh, so if that affects anybody at any point during the semester, uh, don't despair. Just get in touch with me and we'll get you in touch with the people that have access and, and to that equipment uh, to make sure that you get what you need so you can still do the distance learning stuff. Okay, again, we're all in this together. Uh, I want to make sure that you're all going to get like really good grades. You're going to get good documents that you're going to carry out of this class, get great jobs. Maybe you'll all be on Jeopardy one day, win the big bucks, come back, treat me to that steak dinner. Uh, because, you know, uh, I want to see you all do well. And so I don't want anybody in the class, even though we are distanced from one another, because all this is over video right now that I don't treat you the same or think about you the same as I do my students I've had in the past uh, through in-person teaching. You are all you know, very special to me, and I want to see the very best for you all. Uh, and that's something I mean from the bottom of my heart. So any way that you know, I can, through you know, my role as a professor, help you succeed, let's have dialogue on that. Let's, let's discuss these things. Um, as far as the work you've already turned in, I'll be getting back to you on grades on the 500-word uh, summary project now that almost everybody's got them turned in. Uh, and uh, the grades will go up on Open Lab uh, as, long, as well as some of the feedback. Okay? So good luck with this and all your other classes, and I will uh, be seeing you all again virtually very soon. Take care.